Hey, good evening, top fans. Bill from Top Fan Rivalry with another uh, Top Fan Rivalry Clubhouse. Tonight we've got uh, our one of our resident uh, guests uh, with us, Dave, our resident White Sox guy. Uh, and then Adam's joining us for the first time as a group. Uh, Adam and I have done, he's an Angels fan, and Adam and I have done an individual one-on-one. Uh, -on -one, and Adam recently wrote the article about Shohei Otani. So um, great read. If you haven't read it yet, by all means, go on there. But Boys, thanks for joining me tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, there you go. Thanks for having us. There you go. So let's let's first talk about. We had a couple of things happen this last week, and let's talk about a couple of uh, of milestones or a couple of pretty awesome things. I know I'm missing a few things, but Shohei hits forty, and and uh, Miggy hits number five hundred. So, what are our thoughts there? Dave, we'll start with you. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll leave Otani to you guys because I honestly haven't seen him very much being in this, following my team in the Midwest. But, um, you know, Miggy's been a thorn in our side for years. And even now, I mean, he really can't run the bases very well. and He's kind of a station-to-station -station guy, but he's still an incredible hitter. And um, really, really a big a long time ago when they were good. But... Um, Incredible hitter. Uh, Adam, what do you think about uh, Miguel Cabrera? And I, I agree with you, Dave. I think he's an incredible hitter, but Adam, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, being an Angels fan, I just have witnessed a lot of Albert Pujols and, you know, Miguel Cabrera, same same type of hitter, you know, just even at, at 40 years old-ish, he's uh, just an incredibly tough at bat. You know, I mean, he's like he said, station to station, but when he gets in that batter's box, I mean, if you forget that you're facing Miguel Cabrera, he's going to take you deep at, you know, at this age, just like he did when he was young. I actually just watched his first home run, which was a walk off home run. And I mean, if you're going to write a story about a hitter, right? And you're going to talk about this guy hit 400 home, or 500 home runs now. Are you not going to begin with the fact that this dude came up as a child and went and just walked off as a Marlin? I mean, he's he's an incredible guy. And, and the thing that I my favorite by far of him is as he's been a first baseman for the last few years, if you get on first base your helmet's getting knocked off, your belt's getting pulled, your, your gloves are getting pulled out of your pocket, you know, like, and, and it doesn't matter who. And my favorite all time is him and Adrian Beltre. Adrian Beltre. Oh my gosh. Like you got these who are now 35 years old and they're goofing with each other. And for me, it just, it, it's the nostalgia of baseball because it brings you back to like, why did you start playing baseball? You don't start playing baseball on this path to become a major leaguer. You play baseball because you love it. And it's just, it's America's pastime. And, and it's just awesome. And it gets so serious, you know, because so much is at stake. And then you got this guy in his triple crown year pulling batting gloves out of somebody's pocket. I mean, come on, you, you don't get better than that. And I'm not a fan of Detroit. You know what I mean? Like I'm not a Detroit Tigers fan. But if you don't like Miguel Cabrera, you got some serious stuff wrong with you. So here's what I think is in. I agree with you. When I show some personality. Yeah, I, I mean, when he's trying to hit Adrian Beltre in the in a place you don't want to get hit, and I mean, just having a good time. He's out there playing it right. But check this out, fellas. I didn't realize this, and and Dave, I I apologize that we're talking about the Central, and it's it's a kind of a rival team for you, but. So Miguel Cabrera's number 28 all time in home runs with 500. He still has three years on his contract. And now don't get me wrong. His numbers have fallen off drastically, but let's just say over the next three years, he hits 40 home runs. That would put him, listen to the names on the list that he passes. Eddie Murray, Gary Sheffield, Mel Ott, Eddie Matthews, Ernie Banks, Ted Williams, Frank Thomas, Willie McCovey, Jimmy Fox, and Mickey Mantle. If he hits another 40 home runs. Those are some big names. 
So like eight <laughs> Hall of Famers, that's it? Yeah. Only eight Hall yeah. of Famers? Yeah. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, exactly. And if he hits 41 more home runs, he ties uh, uh, David Ortiz, who will be a Hall of Famer. So, I mean, congratulations. The guy's just a good hitter, right? And and it, there's nothing going to swarm around him that says that he was in steroids, on steroids or anything like that. Um, so, I mean, congratulations. <laughs> uh, man, it was, and it was a, he launched it last night too, or yesterday. I mean, he took, he did it well. He took an opposite, or he went opposite field on a pitch outside. Just classic, you know, how they teach you how to hit, right? So. Yeah, he's just a smart hitter. Yeah. And like, like Adam said, you know, if you forget who you're pitching to, then he's going to make you pay. And said, you know, you throw, you, you watch some of these young pitchers coming into the league and they've got a pitch to him. And it's, it's interesting and bad every time, but he's really smart. Could you imagine being a pitcher and, oh, okay, hey, head in there and you're going to face Miguel Cabrera? Like, I mean. Well, and, you know, there's, there's some guys that are probably scared of that confrontation, but there's probably other guys walking in there going, this is my shot. I'm going to challenge them and they get yeah. burned. And that's the mindset, you know, these young pitchers, I feel like, you know, and, and as an Angel fan, you know, we're really toying around with all of our young guys, but, you know, watching them discover who they are, you know, like which guy are they, you know, Dave just mentioned, you know, the two different sides, you know, you're talking about a guy who goes in and is like, oh my gosh, his feet are shaking, can't stop it. And the next guy's going like, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. I get to face, you know, one of the best hitters ever, you know, top 20, like if I'm being just broad about it, you know, top 20 hitters ever and power hitters ever. And I have a chance to go show this dude up real quick. Like what kind of stock are you going to have when that's over, you know? Albert Pujols, same kind of hitter, you know, like you have an opportunity of a lifetime. And when you see a guy go and you can see it in their eyes a lot of the times, guys like Max Scherzer was overshadowed by Justin Verlander for how many years. And you could just see it in his eyes, the different color eyes that, <laughs> you know, he had that intensity, like everything was an opportunity. And that's, that's what I love about baseball. I was a pitcher. I was a catcher. And when you have control of the game like that, and you get to see, the eyeballs of your opponent and see who you're facing. Like it, it separates them, you know, it separates men. It's awesome. Yeah. He's, he's a fun player to watch. And you mentioned Albert for a second and I don't know if you guys saw it, but I, was it Saturday's game? I want to say Albert started at first base and classic Albert, he comes up first pitch and he hits a home run, but that was a court. Uh, he hadn't played for three days. That was a course correction from the game that I was at Tuesday night or Monday night when he, he had a, a 3 0 count and a runner on third and one out, and he swung in a pitch that was out of the strike zone and popped it up to the first baseman. And Dave Roberts took him out of the game after that. But I mean, Albert Pujols, though, he, I don't know if he really is 41 or not. I mean, that we can argue that point. But he is one of those dudes that if you make a mistake, he can still make you pay. And, I mean, Miguel Cabrera is that way, too. Neither one of them are going to win any races. I, I guess it would be a fun experiment to see who can get thrown out from left field first, Adam uh, or uh, Albert Pujols or Miguel Cabrera. But either one of them, I mean, and it's painful to watch them. But, man, do they have a lot of fun playing the game, right? So, um. Adam, give us a give us a since you're the resident angel fan on tonight. Give us a a forty five second on your thoughts on Shohei's fortieth home run for the season. Well, first of all, I mean it's incredible. You know, I mean he's not just hitting forty homers. I mean he's hitting these things so hard. I mean I know Dave mentioned he doesn't get a chance to see him that much, and honestly, I just feel sorry for you because it's. It's so incredible to see this guy on every at bat, even his outs. I mean, how he, how he's taking pitches this year, how he's stealing bases, his base running is incredible. And what you guys may not know, because you probably weren't watching him back then is he was atrocious at base running. He was like a little league player. And 
he got hurt and then he came back and all of a sudden he's an elite base runner. And, and, and that's incredible. But hitting 40 home runs with, you know, 20 something doubles. I mean, the guy is just going crazy. And I'll just share the thing that just nailed him on the head for me was they were interviewing Mike Trout at the Little League special game yesterday. And they asked him, like, what was the most impressive thing that Shohei has done that you've seen? And this is coming from Mike Trout, like the best player in all of baseball. And he said one day Shohei had struck out. And he had told him, hey, if they pitch you high and in, hit it out to right field. If they pitch you away, hit it out to left field. Next at bat, Shohei gets pitched up and in, hits a home run to right field. At bat after that, it gets pitched outside, hits a home run to left field. Mike Trout goes, not only does he listen, not only does he have that humility to be able to take that, but he went and made in-game adjustments at bat to at bat and did exactly what he said to do. He'd never seen that before. Somebody who's, you can't even comprehend the baseball IQ that Mike Trout has, and he's impressed. <laughs> I mean, to me, that was like, I, I think we're still not even understanding who this guy is and how special he is. Says it all. Says it all. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, Dave, you're you're missing out a little bit. I know. Um, I I know Alex Rodriguez and Matt Benskursion had a good time with how awesome Shohei was during Sunday Night Baseball when they played the Sox the one time. But I've seen Shohei pitch live one time this season. And he's hitting spots and he's throwing hard. And it's interesting when you see a pitcher hit spots and throw as hard as he does and then still hit, not only hit, but feel his position. It's something special to watch. It's, it's old school baseball. And he's, it's almost like for the better part of the season, that 90 some odd mile an hour fastball being thrown at him looks like a beach ball sitting on a tee. And he's just having a good time with it. It's it's incredible to watch. It's and I'm you know I'm disappointed the Dodgers didn't grab him. But where would you put him when you're not pitching him? Where are you gonna put him? <laughs> I mean, they were in the running for it, but he's not an outfielder. Where are you gonna put him? Which is funny because I thought the opposite way coming into everything. I was like American League. Like why would he pick the American League? In hindsight, it makes perfect sense. Like what you're saying, but. In the moment, I was like, I, I had no expectation of getting him. The Angels had let me down a million times on, <laughs> on free agents <laughs> and all these players. So I was like, there's zero chance. But looking back, it's like, okay, like this guy wants to do it all. You know, like, and I think it was just my general baseball knowledge that was like, he can't do all of it. So like a National League team would be better for him. You know, at least it gets a chance to hit when he pitches. Yeah. But, Little yeah. did we know that he had so a lot more planned for us. All right, so let's transition. So we've had a couple of, of milestones. Let's transition. We've got about 35, 40 games left uh, for most clubs. Um, barring any COVID incidents with any clubs, uh, the, the season should wrap up uh, pretty close to this time next year or next month. <laughs> um, predictions. Let's, let's kind of go around the horn. Um, and let's just, who's the teams that we're watching? What, I mean, Dave, who do you see out there that is a little surprising to you that think you got a, they got a shot for October or any surprises? Well, I don't know if there's any surprises. I mean, you go around the horn, the, the AL central is kind of a done deal. Yeah. Um, even, even if, uh, teams get a little closer that one's not going to change um you know i tampa's looks like they have staying power um there they're it's a tough team to play against um i think most of the drama is going to be in your division in the nl west and then in the wild cards um you know a lot of these divisions you know they're they're within striking distance but it's tough to make up four or five games now it's a hard task unless somebody really goes on a losing streak. So, um, you know, I look at the wild card and um, that's a little bit of a toss up. I mean, you've got in the A sense, 
Um, you could have two wild card teams from the AL East. So, and then on the other side, um, you could have you could have uh, three teams in the playoffs from the NL West. The surprise is that Cincinnati is in a wild card spot right now. Yeah, that's yeah. a big surprise. I uh... the other surprise is that the Cubs aren't at the dead bottom yet. They're, they're dropping fast. It's good to see. <laughs> Rob had a family thing tonight. Otherwise, he'd be here. He was looking forward to it. He's like, Burke, I'm ready to take some more lumps. My guys are terrible since the trade deadline. <laughs> Adam, that dude's a Cubs fan? Yeah, Rob, Rob is. Dave is a oh, White Sox guy. Oh, and that <laughs> you, you have to go back and watch. I'll send you the clip, but you have to go back and watch. Dave. Dave was like licking his chops like Christmas morning. All right, let's go. The trade deadline's over. You dismantled. How you feeling? <laughs> He's like, I know where you've been. I know where you've been. <laughs> he, he was nice about it, but it was, yeah. Rob took the standing eight count a couple of times. It was it was pretty awesome. Um, Adam, what do you think? Uh, if you go around the horn, what do you think? I mean, are your boy, are the angels out of it? I mean. Oh, no. Dude, they're the the angels will tell us that they're still trying and all this kind of stuff, but they're they're a long ways away. They're they're trying to figure out next year's team. They're trying to figure out which young guys are going to be with the team next year. My thought is that they're going to try to go after like a number one and a number three pitcher in the off season. It's advantage, and we get trout. And Rendon back. I mean, you're talking about two MVP caliber players that are going to be coming back next year. So on the offensive side, we're we're solid. We also have lots of good young guys. But um, no, I mean, for the for the races, I feel like how things are standing now is going to be pretty much how it ends. Um, I know there's a lot of hope in the Yankees, but as David said, I think that Tampa Bay is too they're too balanced, you know, they, between their offense and their pitching, I think they're so balanced that they can sustain. I think the Yankees are, you know, I, I don't think I, they're home run heavy, you know, you either hit home runs or you don't score anything. And when you start traveling during the playoffs and you're not playing with a 297 foot fence in right field, things change, you know, like I got a seven year old who can hit it out of that park. So I, I think that they're in trouble. I think Tampa Bay's got that one. I think the Astros obviously are in. Seattle's not going to – they don't have it to, to come back. I think Milwaukee is, in my opinion, a scary team. I mean, that is a scary team to face at any point of elimination. They are so balanced. I mean, they were good before, and then they got Willie Adonis and, and started smoking people. So – I think they're good. I think the Giants are crazy. I mean, baffled. I mean, honestly, I mean, other than the fact that they got Buster Posey back and he's an MVP caliber player. So what do you, at catcher? Like, I mean, you got Real Muto who's solid, you know, Smith on your team's pretty solid, but like in comparison to Buster Posey and the leadership he brings, that was a huge impact. I think San Diego is fading and I think they're going to continue to fade. Um, I think if I had to make a prediction of who's going to be in the world series, I would say Milwaukee and the white Sox. not to like fluff up to David over here, but I think the white Sox have one of the most exciting teams in baseball. I mean, Tim Anderson stud, Eloy Jimenez stud, amazing pitching, Jose Abreu, sorry, I like forgot about last year's MVP. Um, <laughs> I mean, they have Lewis Robert. They have an incredible team, you know, and they yeah. went through the trenches to get there. But I mean, how rewarding it is. And, and this is the thing about being an Angel fan that sucks is like we're so mediocre, but we don't get the highs. You know, we don't get <laughs> we're going through the trenches, but you know, we don't get the high of where the White Sox are now. I love Tony La Russa other than his killing his young guy that was up early in the year. They got eight hits in a row against the Angels to start the year. Uh, other than that, 
love the White Sox. I think that they're them in Milwaukee. I mean, to think about a World Series with those two teams is exciting, you know, super exciting. That would be fun. Here's a stat for you. So I'm looking at um, the standings here and there's in the, in the national league, there are only one, two, three. There's only three teams in the top six that have a winning record against teams above 500. Yep. The giants, Milwaukee and San Diego have a winning record against teams above five. The Dodgers don't. Ooh. Nope. So you got an easy schedule. Look at the MLB trying to just fluff you guys up. The, the American League um, is a little bit more predictable. The problem here is the one I've been talking about. The White Sox have a, a uh, against teams that are over 500. Hmm. To me, that's a problem. They've got to learn how to beat good teams and you know, they, everybody here in all the Chicago media keeps talking about how Tony La Russa, um, he manages for the big games. He's not so much worried about how many wins you get in August and September, um, and he'll be ready in October. And I'm like, you just can't turn that stuff on. You've got to be ready to go. Yeah. But yeah, you don't have machines uh, you're working with. you got people. <laughs> pitching can beat anybody at any time, but still. I, I thought that was surprising on the National League side. So many teams can't be good teams. So how how excited would the MLB be if the season ended now? Dave, look who's the two wild card teams in the AL what or in the AL. The the MLB would go nuts. It's the Yankees Red Sox. Oh yeah. One game winner go home. The only problem is it's one game because they could I, I hate that one game yeah. like major league teams you know what I mean like it would it would bother me if it was pony league but we're talking about major league team like you can't do a best of three you know what I mean like yeah. I don't know man like one guy's got an off night and you're out of the playoffs <laughs> I don't know. that's a that's oh, a tough one we just played Oakland and I wasn't impressed the White Sox beat up on them pretty good but um you know, we beat, we beat the Yankees on a walk-off on uh, the Field of Dreams game. Otherwise, without that heroic hit at the end, we lose all three to the Yankees. And uh, we just dropped, what was it, two out of three to Tampa. One of them was a late game walk-off again, and then, or an uh, extra inning win. And um, here we are in Toronto starting off with a loss. So uh, I'm not liking how this stretch is playing out. So – Correct me if I'm wrong, but the White Sox have a bad record in one-run games. Isn't that right? Uh, you could be right. I don't know. I feel like I just saw a stat the other day about that. And to me, that was concerning a few years ago. Um, well, quite a few years ago now, I guess. Uh, when the Angels had the best record in baseball, we didn't do well in one-run games. And then we got swept in the playoffs, which two out of three were one-run games. And it ended up being kind of your your kryptonite, your Achilles heel, you know? So to me, every year that the Angels have been good, like good, good, they win those games. Yeah, so listen to this one here. Minnesota is 21 and 18 in one run games. The White Sox are 13 and 20. Yeah. Oof. See, that's a tough one because that's like, I don't know, to me, that's a little bit of like the character of your team. You know what I mean? Like if you can grind it out, like in the very beginning of this year, the Angels were just winning those games and they were so exciting to watch. Like people are like, this is the most exciting team in baseball. Now, other than Shohei, it's like, who the heck wants to watch the Angels? <laughs> you know, like it's not even fun. So I just feel like those are the games where if I'm Tony La Russa, I'm telling my guys, like, we got to win these. You know what I mean? Oh, like, this is what's going to carry you through. Problem has been the bullpen. Everybody says the bullpen's so good. You got Hendricks and Kimbrell and uh, crochet and uh, Kopech and every game I seem to watch, I go check a score and somebody's given up runs late and then I, I start swearing. So they've got some things to clean up for sure. So let me ask you this. So you just brought in a closer 
when you guys had it already a good closer, right? If yeah. if I'm a closer, so I'm in there, I'm a really intense guy. Okay. Like if you haven't already got a little bit of gist of that, I am extremely intense, extremely competitive. If some, if, if I'm on a team and I'm like, dude, I'm a really good closer and I'm supposed to be this intense guy, shut the door, all this. And they bring another guy in just like that. I'm going to be like, I'm not doing as well as I think I am. Like, I'm not going to look at stats. I'm not going to look at numbers or wins or anything. I'm going to feel like I'm being undermined. I mean, do you feel like maybe that has oh. anything to do with that? I don't think so, just because it's not just those guys that are giving up runs, it's everybody, but the way they positioned it is um, Kimbrell gets the eighth and Hendricks gets the ninth, and, you know, if you can get your starter to the sixth or maybe the seventh, and you go Crochet, Kopech, but it hasn't been, and uh, those guys all talk a good game, and Kimbrell is under control for two more years. Uh, or at least one more year, so is Hendricks. So they're going to have to learn to live with each other. But um, I haven't seen any of that. Um, the problem is I haven't seen what their grand plan was where, you know, your starter gets to the sixth and the game's over and you shut the door. And I wonder what those kind of conversations are like between the GM and the coach, you know, like how involved is the coach on bringing your guy in like that? And how are we going to implement yeah. this guy and, and all of that. I mean, like it, it could go any way, but I don't know, man. I, as a competitive person like that, I'm, I have a hard time feeling like any human being can just discard those feelings. Like, I don't know. Interesting. I, know. I mean, those are two incredibly talented dudes. I mean, watching Liam Hendricks in the all-star game, they had them all mic'd up. I was like, what are you thinking? <laughs> like, this... but, but he's been giving up runs left yeah. and right. And, you know, one of the other teams said, I think he's, what has he got? Eight or nine wins now, which means that's eight or nine blown saves. Just on top of the regular blown saves. It's, it hasn't been pretty. I, I, I haven't been. Impressed. Well, if you're playing the Astros, every tip is, every pitch is tipped. So, I mean. <laughs> well, that's true, but. Yeah. So I, I've got some unique predictions for you boys, by the way, Adam, I just, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at what, uh, Dave was talking about um, you guys are playing Baltimore and Baltimore has lost their last 18 games. So they're due. So watch we'll, them sweep the angels. We'll, we'll get them, <laughs> we'll get them back on track. <laughs> yeah. So, so here's some interesting thoughts. I don't see. So Toronto has a, a I'm sorry, not Toronto. Uh, Tampa Bay has a little bit weaker of a schedule in the, or the Yankees. So I think that Toronto can hold on there. White Sox, no question. I actually think the A's are going to win that division. I actually think that the A's are going to win that are division. Six and a half back? No, they're three and a half back. They're three and a half back. And what's what's interesting, oh, okay. um, and here's here's your your two wild cards, right? So the A's uh, or the the Astros may get a wild card spot. But here's your wild card, your other, uh, you know, Yankees will get there. They'll stay in the wild card position. But here's your other wild card team is Seattle. And I know that that sounds unique, that Boston misses the playoffs and so does the Asterix. But so here's, listen to this schedule. Okay, just play the schedule for a second. So the Oakland and Seattle play each other twice, tonight and tomorrow night. Day off. Four with the Royals, three with the Astros. Then three with the Diamondbacks, three with the Astros. Three with the Diamondbacks, three with Boston. Three with Kansas City, four with the A's, then three with the Angels. So they end up playing the, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six. They play the Diamondbacks six more times at the end of the season. And so... You know, there's a shot there. Uh, nationally, and I'm this is up for debate, boys. So you tell me. Nationally, I think the Dodgers will win the West. I think Milwaukee's going to win that Central. Um, I actually think that Atlanta will hold on. They're they're decent enough. And then your wild card teams are going to be uh, San Francisco and Cincinnati. 
Um, the Padres have too much of a schedule. They've got six more with the Dodgers. I think they've got like six more with the Giants. Padres have a tough, tough schedule down the that, and they're just kind of dismantling. Um, Cincinnati's a hot team. They're a hot team. Joey Votto came out of the All Star break and said, "Let me prove something to you. I got something for you. Um, don't forget about me." So, uh, I do think though that the World Series it's going to either be the Dodgers or Milwaukee, and it will be the White Sox, unless the White Sox, you know, have trouble giving up runs late. I just don't see anybody getting past the White Sox. And the I, initially at the beginning of the season, I always told you the Yankees, but Yankees just don't have the pitching. And the Yankees are, again, another team that will score 10 runs, but they'll give up 11. We saw it in the Field of Dreams game, right? I mean, the Yankees were up. Didn't, didn't John Carlos Stanton, was that a tying home run, or did that give them the lead at one point? That was the lead. Yeah, they gave him the lead. That one but... was the lead. There was a home run before that. Yeah. So, and I mean, by the way, that, that, was, pitching... one of, that was one of those games I was talking about. Yeah. That was one yeah, of those games but... I was talking about. You look at the box score. Look at Liam, Liam Hendricks' line from that game. One inning, three hits, four runs, four earned, one walk, <laughs> two home runs. And what so he's that... having a good outing is what you're saying. Just drives oh, me like, crazy. Sounds like a good night for an oh, angel. I mean, it kind of answers your question, Adam. I mean, if you got a line like that, you got nothing to say. Well, but could <laughs> you blame like that on something? Then? I mean, to me, when you're in the back end of a bullpen, your attitude and your confidence is, is I don't know, maybe more than your actual physical yeah. body. Bruce. Two days later, Larusa throws him right back in, and here's his line: one third of an inning, two hits, three runs, two earned. But look at his statistics pre and post acquiring Kimbrel. Yeah, he wasn't that great before either. I bet you there's a discrepancy though. I, I, I'm hoping he's tipping his pitches, and it's something easy. But that's, I mean, I I, I hate Adam. That's a good point, though. I mean, you know, I. That would have been that would have been an interesting conversation to be around was those two closers and saying, Hey boys, you guys are both locked up for a year or two. Fix it, figure it out and fix it, boys, because otherwise this isn't going to be good for either one of you. So and who's the veteran president presence in that locker room? Jose Abreu? Is he their most tenured guy? Yeah, I mean on the on the pitching staff, it's Lance Lynn. He'll he'll put anyone, he'll get anyone back. But he's line. been on the team what this is his second year? The, yeah. the only reason I say it is just, you know, I mean, we all know veteran presence, right? Like Lance Lynn obviously is a veteran, but newer to the team doesn't necessarily mean he's a leader type person, you know. Like Mike Trout, for example, took like eight years to become any kind of a veteran presence, even though he's the best player in baseball for a lot of years before that. And I don't know. I mean, there's just a lot to be said there. I mean, there's a lot of speculation, you know, and, and I would say one of two things is one, it's the attitude and the, in the confidence. And that kind of thing, we're about to hit playoffs and they straighten their shit out or sorry, I don't know if I'm supposed to cuss on here, You're but fine. my bad. Um, <laughs> or B you have two really good pitchers who are unfortunately hitting a, a tough spot at the same time. And you got to count on them coming out of it. I don't know. To me, the White Sox are too, too balanced and strong to, to hit a hump too hard. I don't know, man. Like they. Well, you know, there's, a, there's another undertone here that um, is really important. And that's the fact that we haven't had a major league level catcher since Grandal got hurt, we've got a, a kid that should be in AAA, and we've got a kid that should be in AAA. So, it's a good point. Um, the, you can't you can't underestimate the significance of having a good catcher back there. And you know, you've got two different guys. You know, Zach Collins can't receive. He's a decent blocker, and he, he's okay at hitting, but he's hitting 200. And the other guy, Zavala, has been hitting. He's a good receiver. He can't block a beach ball. So. Um, 
you know, you, you miss Grendel big time. So, and, and you you probably turn a few of those games around with a better catcher. So you you make a really good point. I mean, just looking at the game as a whole, how many good catchers are there? Four. <laughs> and I don't even know if you could fill your hand. Well, and <laughs> like, you have you have you have to uh, you have to you have to divide it up because there are very few good defensive catchers that can also hit. There's a lot of good defensive mm -hmm. catchers out there. They can't yeah. hit. But that's what I mean is you're getting half the game. You know, I mean, these catchers are turning into pitchers, right? Where, I mean, I understand that because most of your job is dealing with the pitchers. But, you know, you look at a catcher and even Grandal, like where's Grandal? Is he with Milwaukee right now? No, Chicago. He's in the White Sox. Oh, okay. I thought he left, but... But even then, like when he was good, what's his batting average? Two sixty, like that. You know, he's not, he was. His average is not good, but um, his claim to fame is his on base because he works counts and gets pitchers in trouble with high pitch counts and stuff like that. I mean, that guy alone, four at bats, he'll probably see twenty pitches. Yeah, which is solid. I mean, and obviously that that holds its own, but. I mean, the days of like good hitting catchers, Piazza and, um, you know, like the Molina brothers, even. I mean, Benji Molina had probably Grandal, the best hitting in Grandal's, Grandal's hitting 188 with a 388 on base percentage. Yeah, which that's incredible. I mean, that, that kind of split, you know, difference between the two. But, you know, it's just, it's crazy because, you know, you got a guy like Rio Muto, right? Who that dude's a good hitter pretty decent on base and he's a good receiver but I think the casual fan like you see the average and you go oh man this guy's trash but like receiving a game and calling pitches and controlling your pitching staff is more important than anything in my opinion I mean I had a lot of years with Mike Sosha so that was kind of how we went but you know that's really important but it's like man especially when you see a guy like Shohei do it as a pitcher and he's fielding right field and this kind of stuff it's like you know, these guys, I don't know. I feel like the catching position is where a lot of, that would be where I'd be looking at. I mean, there's just such a need for good catching. I mean, imagine if the White Sox had, I mean, Grand Dollar, or imagine if you guys had a, like a Will Smith, you know, imagine if you had him. I mean, where it's a bat where, you know, as a pitcher, the guy can go deep, you know, and he can get on base. I mean, if you guys had that, that kind of threat, in a weak spot, that's a huge need. So a couple well, of names. Seeing the effect of seeing okay. the effect of Grandal on the pitching staff right now, and it's not a good effect until he comes back. When's he coming back, Dave? Uh, supposed to be next week. So he. So here's a couple of names as far as far as uh, catchers that that are good kind of all around and, and can be a game changer if needs be. JT, obviously we just talked about that. Uh, Grandall, um, Salvi Perez. Perez. I mean, he's... He's having a phenomenal year. Yeah, Salvi Perez. He's got, what, like, 30 uh, homers? What's that? He's got, like, 30 homers, 29 or 30, somewhere around that. Buster Posey can always change the game. Um, yeah, he's... Yeah. Uh, Will Smith can change the game, but he hasn't been doing it long enough to say that he's got the rep for doing it. But if he keeps, if he puts another season or two together like he is this season, people will pay attention to him. He's not an easy out by any way, shape, or form. Um, believe it or not, Dave, I actually like Carson Kelly. I actually like him as a backstop. I'm not, I, I mean, he can play, but he's, I like him as a backstop. I like what he does for the team. Um, you know, that team's awful, but he's, he's a good backstop. And so, and I don't know what the D-backs are going to do this next season to, to reverse what they've already done, but, you know, make next season better, but who knows. All right. I'm just looking at the receiving stats and, uh, it's about much have the highest rankings on receiving. I do have to say, Max Stassi of the Angels has been having an incredible year. 
He's yes. up in the top 200 top batting 10. average. He's a good receiver. He calls a good game. Yes, he has. I loved his go ahead yeah, home run in Detroit. Yeah. Dave, did you see that game? Detroit was up 10 3. 10 to no, 2. Yeah, ten, uh, Detroit's up 10 to 2 against the Angels going into the sixth inning, and the Angels beat them in nine, 13 to 10. So our our um, our second string catcher is fifty eight out of sixty in the league in receiving. So that's what I mean. It's just someone's got to get with that guy and just show him how to hit. You know, like one of these veteran guys got a Jose Abreu, whoever. I'm sure they're trying, but you know, just get him to I don't know something with pitch recognition or just something. How old is? Zach Collins is a pretty young guy. He's probably 23. Oh, so he's got some time. He's not know, in his prime or anything. I just if if you if you really watch the catching position, and my son caught for a long time. I mean, that's where the glove goes before the pitch and after the pitch. He's terrible. Um, some of these guys, you know, it's a work. You're saying pitch framing. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the basic thing is the glove has to beat the ball to the spot. The glove never beats the ball to the spot with him. I do have to say, though, the umpiring, I I feel like, has been so bad. I mean, you'll see a guy catch it and go, and they call it a strike, which when I was in Little League, I had two coaches who were both former catchers in the Dodgers system, um, both made it to major leagues for a little bit and never, never lasted at major leagues, but I mean, I had AAA professional catchers showing me how to catch as a little league player. And like you're saying, Dave, is they, they taught, you know, get your glove there first, like you're talking about, but roll. So you catch it like this. So it's right. like the ball was there. I caught it in the wrong spot, but the ball was here. So it's this optical illusion yeah. of being in the strike zone. But today, yeah, I don't see barely even that. And I'm like, Martin Maldonado is one of the Martin best. is so good. He was on the Angels for a while. He's an incredible guy. You're, oh, you're right. And, and if you really watch that position and really appreciate what those guys do, that has a huge effect on the catcher um, or the pitcher, I mean, and, and knowing that if they put a ball somewhere close, they're going to yeah. get a strike instead of the ball hitting the glove and the glove going this way and the ball hitting the glove and going that way. Yeah, you see guys catch it's, strikes. And they end up being balls. I mean, you're talking strikes like three baseballs in the zone and they bring it out. And I mean, if, if you know you're, you're calling a ball on the outside and your glove's already here before the ball gets there and you're, you're going to catch it this way, not even just that much movement, but as long as you're already here, where, where do you stick it? And, right and I'm going to tell you this is like I told you, I'm super competitive. If I'm a catcher in Major League Baseball and my pitcher can't throw me more pitches to where I can get that figured out, I'm building a machine or paying some of the data we have. Can you not build a pitching machine? I guarantee they have them that throw just like their pitchers. And you, what are you doing? You sitting there driving your car down the street, trying to show off, doing this and that. Go catch balls. Bro, until you can figure out how to make strike strikes and ball strikes, get your ass in the cage and, and, and yeah. get this going. Because the catching position, in my opinion, is the weakest position in, in baseball, period. I mean, look at these pitchers. We got guys coming up from AAA with a one point something ERA. Like, we don't have any catchers coming up hitting bombs and framing pitches. Like, dude, get your act together. <laughs> you know, like you're a major, you want to be a major league baseball player? Let's go. Crazy. Well, well, boys, this is, <laughs> this has been one of the most interactive clubhouses that we've had. And I love it. And Adam, I appreciate you, you being on and your, your thoughts and Dave. So let's go around the horn real quick. 30 seconds, closing arguments. What are you looking for? Anything, Adam, we'll start with you, Dave, we'll go to you and then I'll end. So, I don't know. I, I, I'm looking to see how this plays out. For my angels, I'm not real hopeful on anything, but I am interested in, you know, just watching baseball, seeing some good games, seeing how it plays out. I'm, I'm interested. I want to see the White Sox and the Brewers. I want to see two teams that 
have him in in the limelight for a little bit and have incredible talent on both teams. I'd like to see them lock it up in the World Series and just see some small ball. I feel like they play 90s baseball, you know, where they're running and they're hit and run and bunts here and there and stuff. So I'd like to see that as a World Series. That That's going to be my my going thoughts. Awesome. Dave? Well, let's see. We finish up here with Toronto, and then we come home and have uh, the Cubs in in our park next weekend. So I'm looking for a sweep, and I'm looking to beat them like 90 to nothing, combined <laughs> score. Um, and then then the season up till now will be a success. And then um, then we just need to uh, need to come. Like I said, that they need to be peaking at the end of September, and you know. The bullpen's got to be solid. The hitters have to be have to be locked in so that you hit game one in October and you're ready to go. So, but um, that's what I'm looking for. You got to you got to you know this is like the Bears in Green Bay. The Bears have to beat the Packers to be successful in any season. Well, here we go. We already swept the Cubs in their place. We need to sweep them again and just destroy them. Just destroy them. Well, I'm hoping I'm hoping Adam that your prediction is wrong. I'm hoping that the Dodgers get back to that the big dance but um this week is is crucial because the Mets um the Mets host the Giants and then the Braves host the Giants where while the Dodgers uh go to the Padres but then they come home to play Colorado so I'm hoping the Dodgers are two and a half out right now I'm hoping we pick up a game or a game and a half someplace and only be down a game going into next week which would be great um Rumor has it that Mookie Betts will be back on Thursday. Um, Trey Turner is playing his, like, lights out, which is phenomenal. Um, he was kind of the afterthought in that trade, and he has been such a spark plug, which is great. Uh, I Probably unpopular. I'm ready to give Cody a shot playing um, in Oklahoma City for a week, try to see if he can't mentally get past. I mean, the guy was a – was a all-star and a MVP two seasons ago. He's now hitting 173 with nine home runs. So that's not going to cut it. Um, but I don't think he's going to get a lot of playing time too once Mookie comes back. So I would like to see the Dodgers pick up another game or a game and a half on the Giants. Now's the time to do it. Um, the Mets are pissed off and the Mets can't afford to lose anymore. If October is a reality for the Mets, they have got to come with their A game and they've got to beat teams like the Giants. So. Anyways, that's what I'm hoping to see. Uh, Adam, Dave, thank you so much for the conversation, top fans. Thanks for watching. Oh, oh, before I go, I know both of you have uh, Instagram and Twitter accounts. So, Adam, uh, what are uh, what's your social media so that top fan can follow it? Oh boy, calling me out here. Uh, it is. And Dave, I'm Adam Hayden, you. 27. So A D A M H A Y D E N 27 is seven. my Twitter. Okay. I think Dave, my, what about you? I think my Instagram is the same thing. Instagram, same thing. Okay. Dave, what about you? DSS CPA 00. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Well, fellas, please come back to the clubhouse. Join us again. This has been fun. Uh, for those of you that are watching this on YouTube, feel free to subscribe. For those of you who are watching it on the side, feel free to make any comments that you like. Um, we'd always welcome those and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We're having a great time. Uh, and if you haven't been watching, we are doing Around the Diamond in 90 seconds every morning. So pay attention for those. Those are a lot of fun. Have a good night, all.